Well, once again, good morning. Glad that you're with us today. I want to uh, direct you back to Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2. So keep your finger in both those places as we'll be going backwards and forwards between those two. Uh, as I said to you last, uh, last Sabbath, when we started this journey, we are looking at Matthew and Luke because they are the two Gospels that tell us the story of the birth of Jesus in explicit terms. So we're looking at two main groups of characters today, and we'll mention a few others as we go along. And um, I hope that you've been blessed as you have been here worshipping with us today. I was sitting in the front there. I was sitting in the front there, and I could hear, because usually we're over here, right, which is a few more meters away. But I was sitting at the front here this morning, and I could hear the congregation singing. I could hear the beautiful harmonies of our worship leaders. And I just thought to myself, isn't this incredible? that we get on a weekly basis to come and to worship like that together. Then I was watching, um, watching Mike over here playing the keys, uh, playing the piano for us, just looking around, playing, all from memory, and with such passion. And I just thought, it's a real privilege. And sometimes we go through the motions, it becomes a habit. It's what we do on a Sabbath morning. And maybe even church can be so humdrum or so stressful for those of you that serve that sometimes it's like, oh, do I really want to go this morning? But I hope that somewhere in the experience on a Sabbath morning, all these parts of service, whether it's the person bringing the word, the person who's uh, playing the musicians, or whether it's the, the, the song leaders up front or a Sabbath school teacher or someone who's teaching your kids, all these people acting their part in service, I hope that somewhere in the midst of all of that, You'll find time to breathe in and breathe out and experience this thing that we call Sabbath, rest, peace. So on that note, let's bow our heads and then we will read the word of God. Father God, it is a privilege to be here and uh, our little minds and hearts, we get so flustered at times. We get so caught up in the activity. I know I speak for myself, Lord, and the preparations and the um, searching out of the word and all the rest. Help us just to stop and to enjoy, to relish the experience of worship. May we be taken in like the shepherds of old with awe, be overwhelmed with the message of salvation. Give us this experience, we pray, this morning, if we haven't yet had it, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Gospel of Matthew, you could say, captures the birth of Jesus from the perspective of the king coming into the world. That's why if you go to chapter 1, there's a rather boring introduction by most people's standards to the story of Jesus. It It is the genealogy. Of Jesus. Not a whole lot of fun, unless you're one of those strange people that are really into family trees and that kind of thing. There's not a, not a whole lot to really grab you there. But Matthew starts with this because he tracks it back to the idea that Jesus is the son of David. Not only biologically, but we know that that was a messianic term that was used in the Old Testament. And Matthew wants to start on this note that Jesus is no ordinary child. He has the pedigree. He has the birthright to be the king of Israel. To rule from Jerusalem. Of course, Matthew's really hinting at something much better. A much bigger new Jerusalem. A much more eternal kingdom a much more forever kingship. But Matthew captures this idea of Jesus coming to the world as carrying kingly birthright. Luke, on the other hand, really captures this idea of Jesus coming into the world as servant. As servant. And so, in light of that, you will notice that Matthew captures the idea of the wise men coming to visit Jesus. People of prestige, people of importance, people of education, people coming from a faraway land in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy to bow before the King of Kings. Matthew, on the other, uh, sorry, Luke, on the other hand, captures the way in which the angels sent from heaven don't go to the palace of Herod. 
Don't go to the seat of Caesar, but come out beyond the gates of the city, outside the city, which is you know, kind of symbolic language when you're outside the city. Where they're tending their sheep, forgotten by civilized society, on some evening out there in the paddock, and the sky is lightened up with the glory of first one angel, and then when they've adjusted, because it is nighttime after all, right? It's like looking into a, a flashlight or into the headlights of a car for us, right? I mean, and an angel is probably just a little bit brighter than that, probably closer towards the sun spectrum of light. And then once their eyes have adjusted and they've had a bit of converse, then suddenly the whole of the heavens explode in the glory of who knows how many angels singing the glory song. What an experience. Two different writers from two different angles capturing the same Jesus and encapsulating all of humanity wherever you find yourself on the spectrum of socioeconomic status all are welcome to come to this Jesus and to bow before him, whether you are a blue-collar worker or a white-collar worker, or whether you have little to no education, whether you're illiterate like the shepherds of old, or whether you, whether you, are, you know, have degrees in astronomy or astrology, hopefully not that one, but you know what I mean. These men of the East, these were probably advisors to kings, and they weren't called wise for no reason. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Matthew 2, verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod, and we'll talk about him next week. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And this prophet, by the way, wasn't even like the greatest of prophets. He was actually quite a corrupt fellow. You know who it was? Balaam. Remember the story of Balaam and Balak, right? Who he wanted to Balak, the king, foreign king, wanted Israel cursed, and he tried to hire the likes of Balaam. And every time he opened his mouth, he spoke blessing instead of curses. This was one of the prophecies that came out of that whole story. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and they saw the child with his mother, Mary. They bowed down, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. How many wise men were there? Tell me. No one knows. No one knows. The assumption by some is that there were three because there were three gifts, but that's not necessarily an indication of how many there were. We do know that it kind of ruffled the feathers in, 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 in the city, right? It must, have been, it must have been something noteworthy to realize that these men had come from so far. There was a certain amount of prestige. There was a certain amount of, of obviousness to what had happened. I, I think maybe there were a few more than three. In fact, Christian tradition, if you go to the Eastern versions of Christianity, or the Eastern churches, the Syriac churches in particular, they say there were at least 12. Some others have said 14. No one knows the number of the wise men, and the number of gifts isn't enough to give us that information. All we know is that this entourage arrived looking for the king, led by a star that was moving. They were people who studied the stars, 
They're called magi, and the word there in, in the original language actually points us back to, to, to perhaps Persia in the Far East. You know, the kind of wise men that Daniel would have served with when he was in Babylon. Persia, of course, today is modern-day Iraq. And so this, the idea is that from the far east or from further east, these men who knew that something was different, who had also been studying the word of God, they knew something about the prophecies of God, and that therefore attributed this unusual phenomenon that appeared to be a star, they realized this must be what the Jewish prophecies... I mean, could these wise men have been part of the lineage that descended from Daniel and his friends that were still left there because not everyone went back to Jerusalem afterwards. We actually don't know a whole lot about this and there's various traditions. What we know is that they were well educated. They were well esteemed. They were from a faraway land in the east and they were fulfilling Bible prophecy not only by reading and studying it themselves but by this very arrival. Go have a look at Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 6. It speaks about the way in which kings would come and bow down. And it even mentions, I think it's frankincense in verse 6. It's this, it's this idea that everything that's happening here has been divinely foretold. It's all part of God's plan. It's all unfolding as he knew it would unfold. And they, coming from the Far East, outsiders. Don't miss that point. Well-educated, well-esteemed but outsiders, perhaps Gentiles, perhaps having some kind of Judaic roots. We don't, we, we don't know enough to really know for sure. What we know is that they weren't considered Jews by people who lived in Bethlehem. And so these outsiders come. They have been searching the Scriptures. And now they have been searching the world by the way, when Jesus was born, and we'll read about this in a moment with the shepherds, we know that that very night the angels appeared to the shepherds, right? That very night. We'll read that in a moment. But these fellows, we don't know how long it was before they showed up. We know that Jesus was no longer in the stable. We know that he was no longer under the care of the innkeeper. The night that the shepherds arrive... He's still there. But when the wise men arrive, he's in a house. Was it a matter of days? Some people would suggest it could be as long as two years later. Which would explain why Herod, when he was betrayed in his own mind, when the wise men were told to go back a different way, not to go back to Herod, don't go and tell him where the baby boy is because he doesn't want to go and worship like he says he wants to. Actually, he has an evil intent and an evil plot. When Herod didn't know where the baby was, what was the age group that he had slaughtered in Bethlehem? Up to two years old. We actually don't know a whole lot of the chronology and the details here. It's not revealed in Scripture. What we know is that they were led supernaturally by a star that I personally do not interpret as a star, but rather as an angelic presence like was revealed to the shepherds. I mean, you think about what would a, an angel or two or a dozen or a thousand, I don't know, but what would they look like from a far away distance and how is it that, this, that the star is moving exactly as they move? You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of the Old Testament. It reminds me of Israel being led out of Egypt. It reminds me of the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. And when it was time for them to break up camp and move, what would happen? The fire or the pillar would rise up and they would know. God's saying, let's move. He manifested himself to Israel and led them through Egypt. And now he's leading this group of wise men to come to this town to find this baby born as a human being, a servant of humanity, and yet as king of kings and lord of lords. I don't think this was an astronomical kind of a manifestation at all. I think it was supernatural. I think these are the angels doing their thing again. Can't prove it to you in the Bible, but I think when you put all the puzzle pieces together... You get that impression. 
says here when they arrived, they had three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. A lot has been said throughout Christian history about what these gifts were for. And we certainly know that from a pragmatic perspective, God was planning ahead for what was about to happen. Because the very next thing you see is after Herod finds out that a king has been born and all his Male kingly insecurities are aroused about his throne being taken away from him and he doesn't want anyone to, to threaten his, his, uh, his throne and that which will belong to his posterity. What does he do? He plans to kill the baby Jesus, not knowing, of course, who baby Jesus is, but an angel, that same angel, Gabriel, shows up again, says to Joseph, wake up, you've got to go, you've got to go now, go to the land of Egypt and wait there. And these gifts... These gifts were worth some serious coin. These gifts were not cheap, ordinary gifts. These weren't trinkets. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These gifts were God preparing the way ahead of Joseph and Mary. They didn't even know what's about to happen. They didn't even know what was going to happen. But this is the beauty, is that God sees around every corner you don't even know is coming yet. When you are surprised, you need to know that God is not surprised. When you get caught unawares and you think to yourself, what are we going to do now? You need to know that God has already seen it and already has a plan. And so these wise men show up just on time, bearing exactly what would be needed to sustain this family as they fled for their lives like refugees, leaving their home country, going into a foreign land called Egypt with nothing but the clothes on their back and maybe a tired little donkey. So God says, I'm going to bring you what you need right on time, just before you need it. I'll provide for your needs. I think that's one of the beautiful things that comes out of this story. Of course, we have a great controversy raging. We have, we have Satan working through pagan Rome, and we find that hinted at in the book of Revelation chapter 12 as well. This controversy is raging with moves by God and counter moves by the enemy, and, and the attempt is to bring to an end before it even starts this plan of salvation. And God steps in. He uses angels. He uses wise men. He, 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 he brings gifts. Out of the blue, to provide for this family. You know, God has got our backs. You know, God provides for us. He takes care of us. There's only one risk for us. There's only one risk for us in all of this. Is that in the midst of our unbelief, in the midst of our lack of faith, we can sometimes blind ourselves to what God is doing or is about to do. We can be so sure that there's no way out that we can't see the way out. But God in his providence meets every emergency. He's capable of taking care of us. He intervenes in our behalf. And oftentimes, long before we even know, we're in trouble or headed towards trouble. I've met so many people in my time as a pastor who have looked at the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And instead of seeing the God who is going to overcome and win the great controversy and already has at the cross of Christ, instead of seeing the story of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world to redeem humanity from sin, this God who's got our back, who's, who's in the midst of history as it unfolds, not only biblical history, but present day history. You and I are still a part of the flow of the plan of salvation. I've met so many people who have studied all the prophecies and all they can see is the moves of the devil. All they can see is the beast and the antichrist and the coming persecution and, and terrible things near the end. All they can see is the trouble that's going to abound. And they completely miss the fact that the book of Revelation is all about the lamb who wins. And they're filled with fear and consternation and worried about whether they're going to make it. And I'm not trying to make light of the seriousness of those times. What I'm trying to say is the great controversy was at play in the coming of Jesus into this world. And before Mary and Joseph even knew there was a crisis coming, God had provided for them. He sent an angel to warn them. And he provided the means that would be needed for their sojourn as exiles, as refugees in a foreign land. God has got your back. 
He hasn't told you the stories and, and the prophecies of Revelation and Daniel so that you'll quake in your boots and worry about the last days. He's got it. He wants you to not be surprised, but he needs you to see him as larger than the beast, as more capable than all the best chess-playing strategies of the enemy. He's got this. He's got you, and he will see us through. I think that, story, that, that lesson comes out in the very birth of Jesus. And if he did this for Christ at the beginning, how much more as it reach its, reaches its final climax before the coming of Jesus? Anyway, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh, by the way, is what was offered to Jesus. Mark chapter 15 was offered to Jesus on the cross when he was suffering. It was kind of used as a painkiller in certain contexts. It was also used as an, to, to be put in an oil for anointing or an oil for embalming. And we find, I think it's in John chapter 19, where, where they come to embalm Jesus and myrrh is a part of that. What's going on here? I don't know that the wise men really comprehended this. I don't think they went, let's choose really symbolic, spiritually significant gifts to give to the Messiah. I think they were just giving the best of what the time demanded of what was available to them. But I think in this gift of the myrrh, perhaps, as many commentators through Christianity's history have said, in this gift of myrrh, you find this dual application of one who's going to be anointed both as king and embalmed as our mortal savior dying, buried in the tomb. The frankincense. This, by the way, was one of the things that would be used as perfume or to be burned as incense. The sanctuary service of Old Testament Israel had incense in the holy place. It used incense on the Day of Atonement. Incense was burnt and it went over that curtain that separated holy from most holy. It was what transcended. It was the connecting link between that holy and most holy place in the Old Testament sanctuary. It was what carried the people's prayers over. It represented intercession. And what, what is Jesus if not our intercessor? The connection between heaven and earth. He is the one whose sacrifice it becomes a fragrant aroma to God in heaven. And gold, a symbol of riches, right? In fact, you'll read in the message to the Laodiceans, one of the things that we ought to, ought to seek is spiritual gold because we are poor, naked, blind, wretched, pitiful. So he says, come, come, get some gold. A symbol of kings. You have the story in these gifts of the humanity of Jesus, of the divinity of Jesus, of the kingship of Jesus. It's the story of his mortality and of his divinity, of his saving work in these gifts. There was a pragmatic purpose. God was providing for the crisis that was about to come. And yet, and yet, these wise men from the east, perhaps even unknowingly, by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, bring these gifts that tell the story of what Jesus is to humanity. I want you to notice the journey of the wise men. Four things about them. They sought for the coming Messiah. They looked for him in the prophecies, following the star. They went up mountains and down mountain passes. They traveled across deserts. They came from a faraway place, which is another reason why we, why we think that, that, that this was some time after the birth of Jesus. They came looking for this Messiah that was foretold, this unusual phenomenon. They followed, they, were, they, 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 they took action to seek out. They sought for the Messiah. They obeyed the angel when the angel said, do not go back to Herod. They took the counsel of God and they obeyed it. When they found Jesus, they bowed. They worshipped. These were important men of education and standing bowing before a normal looking human being, a baby. And then don't miss this. Having sought, having obeyed, having bowed, they gave. 
That's the journey of worship, friends. That's the journey you and I ought to be on. That's what, that's what it's all about. We seek the one who first sought us. We travel through all sorts of paths of life until we find him, until like the wise men, we come to the place where we realize that Jesus is Messiah, God incarnate. We, 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 we obey the word of the Lord to us. We bow before him and then we give. We return to him. This is the act of worship. It's why we raise our voices in song. It's why we return tithes and offerings. It's, it's, it's that Christians are called outside of themselves. They searched, they obeyed, they bowed, surrender, right? And then they gave. They gave what they have. They gave of themselves. That is what you and I are called to. Let's hurry along because we're running out of time. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 here. From verse 1, it says, At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken. This is probably Octavian, who was named Augustus by the Roman Senate to recognize his augustness. Does that make sense? That's what Augustus means. The one who, the one who, is, who is august, the one who is above us, the one who is grand and lofty, the one, he was one of the first emperors that demanded worship as the incarnation of the deity. This was the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. What a contrast between this and Jesus, right? All returned to their own ancestral towns. You know how the story goes. We jump down here to verse 7. Jesus, Mary gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth, laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available to them. That's all that's really said about the innkeeper, isn't there? Not a whole lot to go on, except that we know that Bethlehem, like many other towns, because of the census, had become a tourist trap. Every room was taken. Every bed was gone. And we ask ourselves, we ask ourselves, did they not know who was in their midst? Did they not know that the promised Messiah was there? People from all over the place had come back to their ancestral town, not only to be registered, but to pay tax. That was one of the important parts of the census. The Romans were going to get rich out of this, right? You'd come back, you'd register, they'd count you up, you'd pay your tax, all the rest of it. And no one in that sleepy little town that night knows that the life that Mary carries is the one who gives life to all others. How's that for irony? The giver of life carried in the womb of Mary. And when they knock on the door and they say, we need a place to sleep. Mary is probably in labor already, going through contractions. We desperately need a place. All the beds are taken. All the rooms are full. No one's going to give them give their own comfortable bed up for what looks like an ordinary pilgrim family doing what they themselves have been doing by coming back to this ancestral town. Just your bad luck, you weren't here earlier. And so eventually, as you know, the innkeeper says, there's only one place I can give you shelter where I can let you sleep for the night, and that's really with the animals. And so they go into this little grotto, this little cave. No one really knows exactly what the stable was like. It certainly wasn't the grand stables that our racing horses dwell in today. Right? Don't think of that kind of stable. That is not what we're talking about here. It was pitiful. It was humble. It was the place where you kept your animals, where they made their mess. You know, that's the kind of place it was. And so that's where our Lord is born amongst the filth and the excrement and the animal world while the town of Bethlehem slept in their comfortable beds. There's a lot of parallel between the world today and what happened back then. So that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, verse 8. An angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. I'm sure you would have been too, right? But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will, bright, that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. 
and you will recognize him by the sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Now, when you read that, when you read that, you think, great, he's giving them a sign. You know what I think he's actually doing? He's preparing them for the fact that the physical appearance and the circumstances of this one who's been announced as the king of kings born into the world doesn't match. They were going to rush into Bethlehem to find this king child and then show up and find him, you know, swaddled together with some cloths and in a manger somewhere in a, you know, amongst the animals. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's, it's counterintuitive. And so the angel says, this is a sign for you. In other words, I'm preparing you for what you're going to find because it's not going to make any sense to your mind that this great gift that has been given, that all of heaven has been emptied in, in, in bestowing upon earth, would be so unwelcomed, would be so poorly received, that the only place available for him was amongst the excrement of the animals. So don't be shocked and think, no, we must have the wrong baby, the wrong place, the wrong child. Let's continue our hunt. No, this will be a sign to you. You will find him, the king of all kings, the majesty of heaven, the only hope of humanity amongst the animals in some grotto somewhere because no space is found for him. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. There's the message of hope right there, friends. That's the gospel. The angels proclaimed the gospel that night. Don't be afraid. We haven't come to destroy. Don't be afraid. We are not the angel of death bringing judgment. Don't be afraid, though, you're, that you're, you're, though you're, uh, your senses are overawed, though you're blinded by the brightness and the radiance, though you realize your sudden smallness in the grand scheme of things, that, that, that don't be afraid. We come in peace and we bring you the message of hope that God has loved you, that God has has considered you worthy of being reconciled to the family of heaven and as a token, as the means of this reconciliation, you will find the very incarnation, the very impersonation of deity in the person of Jesus. He is all that God is given to humanity. Heaven was bankrupted and earth was enriched, though the world would not receive him. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. I want you to realize that there's a reason they're out in the fields with their flocks. They're taking care of them. They're protecting them. There's wild animals. There's, there's livestock thieves. You don't just leave your flocks out there in the middle of the field. This was their money. This was their bank account. This was, their, this was the way they earned their living. And so they slept out in the fields. It probably took shifts. Some were awake. Some were sleeping. All were awake when the angels arrived. And in the midst of this grand announcement that all of heaven has been emptied as a gift to humanity, they abandon everything. Leave it in the field as worthless to go find the gift that is more valuable than anything else. Do I even need to explain that to you? Okay, maybe. You and I get so fixated on the things of this world. We get so hung up on pursuing the dreams of this life. We get so preoccupied with the busyness of life. All the while, we're missing the joy of the greatest gift of heaven. We take it for granted. We are like sleepy Bethlehem. Do we understand the gift that has been given to us? Don't be afraid, the angel says. We bring you good news that will bring great joy 
to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in the strips of cloth lying in the manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by that vast throng of others. The armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. This is the good news of salvation. This is the news you and I are supposed to build our lives on. That God is pleased with us, not because of who we are, but because of the gift he's given to us in the person of Jesus. The angels that night proclaimed this idea of righteousness by faith. This idea that, that heaven has taken this grand step towards earth. Here they have, that, that heaven has emptied itself. That this gift of grace has been bestowed. That we might be reconciled. That we, may, that we may have the illusions of this world stripped away from our eyes. That we would no longer be infatuated with the shortness of life. And with the accumulation of this world's values. And with the, with the accumulation of things. And, and the ideas of status. And false ideas around success. That we would, that we would realize that this life is a moment in time, like a full stop on the line of eternity that never ends. And yet so often, so often many of us just want to live for this brief moment of full stop in the scope of eternity. Because it's all we see. Jesus didn't look like much. He, didn't, he wasn't born in the palace, as we've said. He wasn't born to a profound family. And he didn't look any different to you and me. And too often in our world today, this is still how people look at him. Just a character from history. Just a human being. Just a story. A legend, maybe. A fable. What do you make of this Jesus? The shepherds, they dropped everything. They left it in the field. Whatever happens to it, that's okay. We are going to go find this greatest gift of all. And I love this. I love how in these two stories, Matthew and in Luke, you realize that all of society is encompassed. From the upper echelon of, 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 of of earthly education and of social standing and of recognition and of fame and of all that stuff. These men from the Far East, the highly esteemed, that even catch the eye of King Herod, right? As they show up in his territory. From those who sit upon the throne and the wealthy, right through to the common and the ordinary, the, the blue-collar worker, the forgotten, the shepherds, the smelly, those who live out in the fields, who, who do the hard yards, from the palaces to the, to the homeless, if you like. In these two tellings of the birth of Jesus, you find Jesus bringing all of humanity towards himself. There is place for the rich, and there is place for the poor. And the family of God that we call the church is supposed to be home to it all. Because both of these groups of people bowed before the same king. And in that moment where the rich and the powerful bowed before their Messiah, where the smelly and the dirty and the ordinary bowed before their Messiah, the playing field was leveled there at the feet of Jesus. I think one of the greatest lessons that comes out of the Christmas story is that all the social constructs constructs that we live by, the castes, the statuses, the way we judge by external appearances, none of it actually means anything. And the tragedy sometimes is that still in the church today, we bring those artificial constructs into the church we favor this group or that group or the other group or whatever the case may be. At the feet of Jesus, none of that stuff means anything. All are alike. Whether you are Pakia or whether you are Maori. Whether you are Chinese or whether you are French. 
whatever language you speak, whatever educational standing you have, however high up in government you may serve, or whether you have no job at all, whether you live in a mansion on the hill or whether you're struggling to just find a housing New Zealand house, at the foot of Jesus, none of that stuff matters at all. And Jesus, God Almighty, doesn't see any of that stuff. He sees hearts. He sees hearts. And you know what he's looking for, whether in the rich class or in the poor class? You know what he's looking for? Willing hearts. Hearts that will surrender. Hearts that will search. Hearts that will obey. Hearts that will bow. And hearts that will give. I think the Christmas story challenges us to surrender our false notions of what makes a person important. To be able to look at all alike. And the ones that would impress us with their earthly successes to realize, you know what? We're just one flesh. And the ones that might disgust us because they seem to be below us to realize, you know what? We are one flesh. Because at the feet of Jesus, there's none of that. The church is called to be a home, a place where all are welcome, where none are favored, where we search, where we obey, where we all bow, and where we all give, serve. May God bless you as you seek as you seek to be that church, that people of God, these missionaries for Christ. What were the four things? Search, obey, bow, and give. That is the family of God. That is what we are called to, whatever your station in life, that we'd be able to sing that song, I would rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing this song in response.